it's the church of what's happening now. <laughs> Open it up with a bong hit out of respect for Sober October. Greetings from Podcastville. The church of what's happening now is brought to you by Kettlebell Kitchen. Yeah. Their mission is to change people's lives through make, making healthy food more accessible. Listen, eating healthy is on everybody's mind right now, correct? What, when, and how much you eat, it's hard to know where to start. With kettlebellkitchen.com, you, listen, it helps you stay on your diet by taking out the hassle of shopping and cooking. These meals come right to you twice per week. Whatever works for you, vegetarian, keto, Whole30, paleo, they got it. Listen, they sent me a beautiful kit. It had the grass-fed steak, the bison beef sliders, tremendous. And I don't even like bison beef. How's that for you? So what the hell are you waiting for? Feed the champion inside of you with Kettlebell Kitchen. Go to Kettlebell Kitchen right now and enter code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, for $25 off each of your first two orders to the new customers. That's $25 for the first two orders at kettlebellkitchen.com. Press in church. The church is also brought to you by Hymns. Listen, 4hymns.com is a one stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for mm. men. Listen, with age comes wisdom, but getting older can also be a downer in a specific area. 40% of men by the age of 40 struggle from not being able to get and maintain an erection. That's somebody admit it. Okay. Now, why do guys turn to weird solutions? Or do nothing when they can turn to medicine and science. 4 has the answer. With well-known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions to help you combat ED. You see the results where other treatments fall short. Try today. Try today by starting out with a free online visit. Go to 4 slash church. Again, grab a pen. For hymns, F O R H I M S dot com slash church. And what we're going to do is we're going to give you a fr- the first free support. I mean, listen, this would, would cost hundreds if you went to a doctor's office or a pharmacist. Right now, just go to for dot com slash church. Listen, I'm not going to tell you again. It's fucking uh, Wednesday, right? But tomorrow it starts all over again. Everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. I got the answer. MyBookie.com. MyBookie.ag. Football season is upon us, right? You like making money. You like betting sports. They got basketball, football, MMA, two fucking praying mantises fighting in Jersey. (laughs) They got everything. If you're trying to bet the NFL, baseball, they got better incentives and more lines than any other fucking sports book. They just revamped their site. It looks fucking tremendous. Go take a look already if you haven't. And what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to double your first deposit today, right now. Use promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, and get 100% bonus on your initial deposit up to $1,000. Who's better than you? Nobody. Visit mybookie.ag today. That's mybookie, M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E dot A-G. And don't forget to use promo code CHURCH when creating your account to claim this bonus. Listen, you play, you win, you get paid. Cut this shit. Go to mybookie.ag. Kick this motherfucking mule Lee. All right, what's happening here, Greg Fitzsimmons? Joey Diaz, I got to tell you, man. You're the real deal. Just the- just hanging out with you for 10 minutes before the show. Nothing makes me happier. You're just no, a, you're just, just a fucking real guy. Why you don't fuck give a around? shit. No, there's no all talking that shit, shit about gonna... sober October, making me laugh about fucking Ari. I just got here doing bong hits. What, yeah, what are, we, what are we gonna do? It's a beautiful day to be alive. It's eight degrees outside. We got our legs. Yep. We got our arms. We got our right. health. Right. Uh, no yeah. ED. No erectile dysfunction. You ever get one drop on you? Fall down a flight of stairs. Well, what's that? Your dick. Uh, I'm getting to the point now where you get it there, and once you bang out one, then you're done. Done. Like, done. It used to be where I could <laughs> shoot one that would stay half of the tension. Yeah. And then you go back in there for the second stab, and that lasts a little longer, and everybody sees stars. Yeah. 
that got cut out. Now I got a, I got a twenty four hour shot clock on mine now. Yeah. It resets. Yeah, twenty four yeah. hours. It's it's. Uh, and the yeah. worst is I I'll go to my office. I got an office like this, about the same size, just fucking all business, and little couch, and uh, you know I'll watch some Japanese hidden camera massage porn, lesbians, <laughs> and I work one out, and then I come home that night, and the wife throws a move on me after the kids go to bed, and I got to look her right in the eye and go, too late, sweetie too late that one's gone no i usually don't bang one out in the daytime i'm no? a late night type of dude really yeah i don't know why i'm not a daytime banger either i like late night when i got nothing to do at night you're bored you might as well bang one out i go take a pee and i'll bang one out standing up no shit yeah i'm old school I standing up yeah. You land it all in the water, or is it all over the place? Fuck yeah. No, I land it right in the toilet, and then I close it, and it's a little space sea monkey. Remember in the 70s? <laughs> yeah, you put that powder right. in the water, and you close the... <laughs> sea it's, monkey. I got a back bathroom. Yeah. I come in that toilet, I'll put the <laughs> lid down. I go away. I come back two days later. I got like a half a kid in there. There's like a, there's like a hand with a fly on it in there. It's telling me, help me, help me. Get the fuck out of here. I flush them down the toilet. You got to... Heard of fucking horses. I got a back bathroom that gets those retarded flies. Yeah. Okay. I, I, when what I take what a do you shit, mean? They're slow? They get big and slow? I don't slow. know what happens. I open up the door and I take a shit. And while I'm taking a shit, I, you know, I, I love taking a shit with the back door open. Yeah. I, I, the per, when we rented this house and I saw the layout, nobody comes to that bathroom. You have to walk through too, too many mazes. So it's my bathroom. I got a couple kettlebells on the floor. <laughs> I got some club weights and shit. I got two punching bag, uh, two gloves in there. I got my bong in there. I got that like wall watch in the back door, my Santeria stuff. And I got the shitter. And it's perfect. And I open the back door. And the sun comes in at 6 in the morning after my first cup of coffee. And as I'm fucking smoking bong, it's this shit flying out of my ass. When you cough, what's better than coughing out of bong? It There's nothing better. No, it comes right out. And for some reason lately, as you get older, you get those extended pieces of shit. What? The ones that aren't long no more. They, they're like six inches, but the middle has like a four-inch gap, yeah. like a mushroom cap. Right. So your ass stretches out for a minute. Yeah. It's like fucking... You guys are both saying yes. Like, I, what are you talking well, about? Yeah, as you get older, your body changes. Okay. You young guys, so your shit's changed. So the, 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 like, like last a... week, last Monday, and I got to be honest with you, I'm on, I'm very, I, I do not do pain pills, but I had an Altoid can. That people give me on the road. People give me the different pills. I put in my little Altoid. Like Vicodins, hydrocodone, whatever. I got whatever. everything in there. Do you know what each pill. one is? No. Uh, <laughs> not really. Not really. You know, I have an idea, <laughs> but not really. So some nights, you know, so when we had the last night before Sob October, we came in here and we and I had like six codeine threes, and I ate them. Let me tell you how much I don't eat pain pills. They clogged me up all week. Oh, yeah. That's the problem. They destructed me all week. Coffee. I could feel the shit in my stomach. Yeah. I finally said, fuck this. The other morning, I ran over to Pete's, the Mexican place up there. They got a fruit salad. Whenever you eat there, at the end, they give you a fruit cup with the Mexican cream on top. It makes you fucking your dick hard just eating it. Yeah. They give you a couple of blueberries and raspberries and strawberries and uh, melon, the, the green melon. Right. It's tremendous. I just went up there and said, give me a fruit thing with no cream on it give me half the cream i ate the whole fucking thing and friday night i was on that throne like i said they were coming out in chunks yeah you could hear it it's like people throwing sheetrock off the yeah, roof yeah. it was like bah, 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 bah. and your asshole is distended three, three times i went in there and it was like 10 minutes of bah, yeah. bah, like flushing i had to get up and fucking get the pogo stick and push it down <laughs> Whatever the fuck you call that thing. Loading a cannon. I yeah. had a fucking, I got the big extended one for gorillas. Yeah. The ones they use at the gorilla cage in the Bronx Zoo. I'm pushing down on this motherfucker. <laughs> but for some reason, I attract, I attract these flies, and they go against the bathroom window, and they kind of get retarded. Yeah. Right. So after a few days, they just come into my lair, and I got a little weed container, <laughs> a glass container that's empty weed, and yeah. I put them in there. I take one of their wings off to fuck them up a little bit, and I put little holes and I feed them weed. I just give them weed, and for three or four days they're just eating weed. They don't know. 
And I just put more flies in there. I got about eight of them in there right now. And they're oh, fucking. Do you let them out? No, no, they're in there. I'm like, That's Hanna- it. I'm like that dude in Hannibal Lecter that collected the bugs and put them up chubby chicks pussies. Yeah. And then he would drop them off in the weeds <laughs> off the 170. What's remember the put the cream on the skin? That dude, the yeah. creepy dude. Drop the yeah. drop the lotion in the yeah. bucket. Drop the lotion in the bucket. I don't remember bugs going in the pussy in that movie. Is that no, there was a moth. Remember? It was a moth. Oh god, I don't I don't remember that. He would part. put moths in their mouths or something. Oh. Yeah. That's how they found them. They right. found the moth in the mouth and right. They they figured out that the moth got sent from some other country. And yeah. No, I used to take those Vicodin. I got a I got shoulder surgery. This is probably going back five years. I got shoulder surgery just from repeated throwing shit my entire life. Just the right the right shoulder needed to be rebuilt. And they gave me. I had the surgeon write me Vicodin. I had the general practitioner write me hydrocodone. I had uh, somebody in physical therapy write me somebody. I, I was filling every everyone for fucking nine months. These guys kept refilling it. And then I'd go into people's medicine cabinets. If I came to your house for dinner, I'd excuse myself to go to the bathroom and I would rifle through your shit and I would take your hydrocodone. If there's anybody out there, friends, family, that have had me over in the last five years and you think you got a little hydrocodone left for when you get a, a backache, you're going to have to refill that. That's gone. Thank you for the honesty. Yeah. That's why I don't put my shit in the bathroom. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'd go to open houses. I got my medication in the weirdest places. Yeah. Like my blood pressure medication <laughs> in the kitchen next to the refrigerator. So I'm reminded to take it. Yeah. And all my do pills. Out I getting. got them hidden. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Those are hidden because I don't want Mercy to find them. I know. You got to get a safe. And I don't. First of all, I don't have them to put up in my, like some people take them and they put them in their medicine cabinet. Yeah. I don't have the anxiety shit the doctor gives me. Yeah. I don't put it in there. I don't even take it on the road. I wash more of those anxiety pills that I oh, take. Oh, you tell me. You put them in your pocket before I you come to the store. I wash more than I take. Yeah. You know, so. But it was interesting. Before the podcast started, we were talking about the Friars Club. Oh, right. What right. are the requirements? Well, back in the day, the requirements were that you had to be a man. I don't know what the. I don't think there was ever a race rest- restriction. There's a lot of private clubs in New York that had race restrictions. You know, you had the uh, the union club and the players club. There was a whole like circuit of private clubs. They're mostly in like old, beautiful brownstones, like five story brownstones. And the Friars Club was founded as a club for entertainers. It was for comedians, Borscht Belt guys that were on the road, uh, Broadway actors, songwriters, entertainment attorneys, agents. And they would, they all joined this club and they would just hang out and they had a uh, the Joey Lewis bar. You came in on the left and it was one of these old time New York bars with the fucking red padded rubber on the edge of the bar and then some deep black booths in the back. And they serve you the fucking peanuts that everybody's pissy hands have been rifling through all day, but you eat them anyway. And guys just come in there after work, have a couple of drinks and then during the day, guys would come in for lunch. The dining room was fucking beautiful. I think it was the Frank Sinatra dining room. And you get the Dover sole, and they they take the bones out right at the table. They come over, and they fillet it for you right at the table. And you just put it on your account. Nobody, You don't bring money to the Friars Club. Everything is just they know your number. They throw it down. Then you go upstairs, and they got a, a, a card room. Guys play cards all day, betting, all fucking like... These, you know, they're working at night. They're comics. So they have their lunch. They play cards. And then upstairs, they get a steam room that's the best steam room in the city. And you walk in. You get your little locker. And then they give you a robe. And you walk into the steam room. Guy comes in. He's got a towel. And then he's got a washcloth that they, they, uh, that's got ice cubes on it. And he hands you that, the glass of water. And then uh, when you get out, you walk into the shower. You take a shower. Big fucking... Big shower with the the power nozzle that blows that shit. It's like a civil rights riot in the 60s. You're getting blasted against the wall. German shepherds are barking underneath the the stall. And then you come out and this Polish guy takes a towel, not making this up, and he fucking pats you dry, your whole body. You just stand there with your arms out. This guy pats you dry, everything but your dick. And then he wraps a towel around your waist, hands you another glass of water. And then you go back and you go sit and you put the robe on. 
and they got these uh, these lazy boys sitting outside by the gym, big screen TV, Variety magazine, Hollywood Reporter, and you sit down and you fucking watch a little MSNBC, read Variety, put a towel on your head, take a nap, and then you go out to your show that night. Do you have to let the guy draw you off? Why wouldn't you? I don't know. That seems fucking great feeling. How, how long have you been a member of this for? I joined in '93. And what are the requirements? I mean, you got to have uh, somebody recommend you and second you, and then they review you, and then you come in and <clears throat> they have a little ceremony where they swear you in and read you the rules and all that stuff. So I joined. My father was a friar my whole life. I watched. I watched the OJ chase at the Friars Club. I watched. You know. The 86 Mets win the World Series in that Friars Club. They had a they have a TV viewing room that's fantastic. You know, and the waiters are everywhere in fucking black jackets and bow ties getting you drinks. And uh, and then my I sponsored this woman, Sarah Fearon, funny comedic actress, kind of quirky. And I uh, I submitted her. She got accepted. She goes to the ceremony. And she brings her friend Aaron. And I'm there and I talk to Aaron. She's with a guy. But I talked to her for like 20 minutes. And then after the ceremony, I said to Sarah Fearon, I said, I'm going to marry your friend someday. And uh, three years later, I started dating Aaron, took her to the Friars Club, proposed in the Mer- Milton Burl room. I proposed to her. She said yes. The rest is history. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. Now, can I ask you a question? Yeah. You're a pretty smart guy. We love each other. (laughs) We really do. I know what you're going to say right now. Why the fuck don't I want to go there? I got a call last night from Josh Wolf. Well, let's start the story straight. The other day I'm watching TV. And when we come back, we're going to show you the first new Hollywood marijuana restaurant cafe and uh they flash to it and they show a bunch of white kids online vaporing and they show people inside ha 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 and smoking a blunt and they got high powered fans and right there and the food's all got pot in it i, I don't know yeah. i don't know but right then i knew like you would never see me close to that yeah like i knew what that decision last night I was talking to Josh Wolf, and he goes, have you gone to it yet? It's great. And he goes, you should go. And I go, Josh, how long do I know you? You do know that I would never step foot in that fucking place. You know, I've been smoking dope since I was 12. I got nothing to prove to know, but I got to go down to a restaurant <laughs> and smoke dope yeah, to right. show these assholes that right. I smoke dope. Yeah. The fuck out of my face. And that's all anyone's talking about is smoking dope every um, night. It's It's, but no, back to the, Why do I feel this way? I mean, you're a smart guy. Like, I sit at home at nights. Like, I schedule myself because I know I'm at an age. I can't go out two nights in a row at the comedy store. It's too much excitement for me. Yeah. So now Thursday, I got to take a nap. So I'd rather go to the store Tuesday and Thursday and space it out. But when I'm sitting at home Wednesday, it's 8 o'clock. My daughter's going to bed at 8.30. My wife doesn't give a Frenchman's fuck what I do. And I got 20 options. And I don't want to do any of them. It's so weird not to offend you. You know, I dearly love you. I've seen, like, pictures from the Friars Club and how they act and Billy Crystal. I would stab myself in the eye after five (laughs) minutes in that. I don't like none of that shit. Yeah. You know, it's like I still remember wanting to go to Montreal so bad and saving up the money. And I talked Slayton into putting me on during the Dirty Show. And I took a flight to Detroit. And when I checked into the hotel room in Detroit because I was going to go to Montreal in the morning, I was like, who the fuck am I to go there? They didn't invite me. I'm not a part of those people. And even if I go there, I don't want to be there. Like, oh, my God, you have such a great time at the bar. Yeah. It's the same jerk host I could see on Tuesday at the comedy store. Right. I just see them now getting drunk in their, in their environment. I don't want to. I don't know what it is about me. Like I do not want to go there. Well, you're an outsider. That's your that's your identity. Is you did it your way, 
and maybe you weren't embraced by the mainstream. You weren't no, given wasn't. those same kind of breaks no, that wasn't. somebody else might have gotten. And I don't know why. I mean, some people could say it's uh, maybe because people are afraid of you. You're, you know, you're aggressive on stage. You say shit nobody else says. It's not politically correct. It could be racist. You know, you're not, you're not white. And, uh, you know, you're... I'm, I'm not... You're a felon. Do, do, is it you're an, an outlaw. Is it an insecurity that I have? Or is it a, a character that I've created? For me, it feels like, an, like I've always felt this way. I remember the night you came down, and this this might this might have felt like that environment to you. As I was doing a, I do a benefit show every year for the best buddies. We're doing it at the Improv, and it was like, for whatever reason, I ended up booking. I usually book it because I'm I'm at somebody's house and they got people over, and I think, oh, I got to book this fucking thing. Except for you, who I just call for anytime I do a benefit, I call you straight out of the gate. And I was there, and so it was Zach Galifianakis, and it was Sarah Silverman. And I think it might have been Brian Posehn. So it was kind of like, I think it might have represented like that kind of Largo world or that alternative comedy world that maybe you never felt a part of. And I remember seeing you, you didn't come in the room. You were standing in the back. You didn't want to come until you went on. And I think you were feeling like a little bit trepidatious, you know. And I hadn't seen you like that before. And you went on stage and you fucking ripped it apart. And you were doing the bit about the chick pissing in your face, and you just didn't give a fuck. And I'm sitting with them in the corner, and I'm curious to see what their reaction is going to be to you, you know? Because this is not Largo. This is not, you know, pro-feminist, you know, with their use. And they, their fucking jaws were slacked. They were like, what, <laughs> what just blew on stage? What fucking storm just settled over the microphone of the improv now? And they, they fucking loved it. They were like, this is unbelievable. And I remember you walking out and, and I, I knew that, I don't know that you saw them or how they reacted, but I think you felt really good that you just did what you do and that whatever anxiety you were feeling before, that didn't come on stage with you. It was pure Joey Diaz on that stage. Well, I always have anxiety. Yeah. You know, once I walk into the battle zone, yeah. the comedy store, the anxiety goes up 150%. Right. It's like when Michael, you know, one of the greatest things about The Godfather is what, whatever, whoever the director was or whatever the idea he got, when Michael goes into the bathroom before he shoots a lot. To get the gun, yeah, in the Bronx. To train. That train. If I know Greg Fitzsimmons is sitting in this office and I got to put a hit on Greg Fitzsimmons. And I have to do it myself at 9 o'clock at night when he's doing a podcast with Lee. As I walk up those stairs, your adrenaline goes so high. Because I've been in that situation before where I robbed somebody or robbed jewelry. Uh, when anytime I did anything that was that creepy, like robbing a house or robbing a drug dealer, you go deaf. You hear a zzz, like that's all I would hear. Like your heart is pounding so much, there's so much adrenaline going into your body that that's what you hear. You kind of hear a simulation of what Michael heard on that train. The other night I went to the store. My wife made chicken cutlets for lunch. She went to church, she made chicken cutlets. When she came back, I had like two chicken cutlets. Four or eight to chicken college because what do you want for dinner? She gave me the menu for dinner. I was like, you know what? Don't worry about it. I gotta go to the store anyway. I'll stop at Joe's Pizza and get dinner. I just got a slice. I got I had 14 points left. So I get to the comedy store the other night. Some dear kid that I've known for 20 years was talking to me. I really couldn't hear him, even with the hearing aids on. I couldn't hear him, and to be honest with you, I didn't want to hear him. There's nothing to talk about. When I walked in, there was two boxes of Joe's Pizza <clears throat> on the piano in the main room. I didn't eat. In the green room. In the green room. Yeah. I, I didn't touch them. Right. You know, and I remember going on stage and getting it over with. And then when I came back, I could hear the kid. Mm -hmm. Now I could have a conversation with him. Right. Why are you talking to me? Right. I'm about to go to war. Yeah. What are you talking about? What? 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 
and he, all I could hear was he sounded like Charlie Brown. Like, and he kept talking until he finally got it that this guy doesn't want to be bothered or he's not even hearing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm going up in the main room. I right, got no right, time right. for just more talk. Right. I don't give a fuck about whatever the fuck. Where we met. When I go to the I did a guest I, spot on I, your show yeah. in St. Louis four years ago, yeah. and you're supposed to remember. I got to jog my memory right. about yeah. somebody. It's oh like, dude, God. if I if I remembered you, it means you were memorable. If I don't remember you, it, let's not rehash something that wasn't that important in the first place. That's why I hate doing two shows, because I want to talk to the people after the first show. The crowd. But if you have a second show, you really can't. Yeah. Because that's an hour of a quick. All of a sudden, it's fucking jeopardy. Right. You know, it's Wesley. Uh, do you remember what you said in episode 274 of the Rogan podcast? Why did you say this on Greg Fitzsimmons' podcast? Just take the picture and shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> I don't even know what the fuck I just said on stage. <laughs> and you want to know what's with the fucking questions? Yeah, right. Just take the fucking picture. Right. Here. And then they get the uh, camera out, and it's the, 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 the fucking lock is on. The girlfriend's trying to open it. Yeah, she doesn't know the code. Yeah, so you just flash. wasted eight minutes yeah. with your stupid fucking question, which I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> We're in a room with 300 people on a line waiting to take pictures. I got no fucking idea what you said. Yeah. Come over here. Let me put my arm around you. Let me give you a compliment. Take a picture. Let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Right. And then they come back, and they tell you stories. I can't fucking hear you. Even with the fucking earpiece, I can't fucking hear you. There's 300 people in the fucking room. So before I go on, like, I really like the comedy store. After my little Netflix debacle, I made a decision I'm only going to the comedy store. And I have a, like tonight, I love my friends. But you know what? Leave me fucking alone on Tuesday. You don't want to come to the store on a Tuesday night. It's chaos. It's chaos. It's two sold out shows in the main room, one in the original room, and three sold out shows in the belly room. That's a total of 1,200 people in that building. Not to mention 100 comics lurking to suck on blood or whatever the fuck they do down there. And the staff and the waitresses. You know, you want to come down there on a fucking Tuesday night and talk? Well, I wanted to bring you a script. You know what? Yeah. Tuesday night's right. my work night. Right. You know what I like about Tuesday night? What I told you that night when I called you when we saw Magic that night. You're right. I go in that, I get two orders, I fucking get high, I take an edible sometimes, and I want to sit in the original room and watch the three comics before me. And I want to learn. And I don't want to be bothered. Guess what? I'm, get the fuck out of here with your stupid fucking questions. Yeah. I'm watching Ali Wong. Get the fuck out of here. Can I watch Ali Wong? Mm. Is it okay? Yeah. You know, I like when I see you. You just sit next to me. We hug each other, and we both watch and laugh. Right, you know? right. There's people that come. I'll never forget one night. I'm sitting there minding my own business, and somebody bent over and whispered in my ear, oh, you're taking the Charlotte with you. And I just gave him a look. <laughs> like Val Kilmer yeah. gave that white guy at the diner in Heat. Remember when the <laughs> yeah, guy's yeah, like, right. man, I had to go down. And Val Kilmer looked at him like, what the <laughs> fuck are you fucking talking about? Like I, that, I swear to God, yeah, I haven't yeah. seen this guy, in my, and he's a sweetheart of a guy, right? Sweetheart of a guy. Oh, and then here's what I get: there's this female comic at the store, and uh, I'm outside, and somebody goes, uh, "Oh, you know, so and so," and I look at her, I go, "I don't think, I don't think we met. I'm Greg," and she goes, "Doesn't shake my hand." Yeah, we met before. We met before, and I've been and I've been a comic here for such and such amount of time, and I go, "Oh, sorry about that. I just, you know, I don't have a great memory. I have fucking terrible memory." I have no facial recognition whatsoever and forget names. So that becomes her thing now. Every time I see her, she does this, oh yeah, you don't remember, you, do you remember me this time? It's like, hey look sweetie, you know, I I do my best. Just because some people have photographic memories, you got a guy like Patton Oswalt. That guy can remember the fucking third track on a, you know, on a fucking Aerosmith album that flopped in the 80s and he knows every word to it. He can name every person that was on a show. I don't have that memory. I don't remember shit. So you're going to hold it against me? It's not that I don't like you. You're perfectly fine. I watched her act. She was funny. Did I remember her the first time I met her? No. Fucking let it go. I have a phenomenal long-term memory. Really? 
words, speeches. Like there's times I'm reading a book, like a crime book or something, and they describe a conversation. I always think about that conversation. How do you fucking remember something that was said in the room 30 years ago? Right. Guess what? I still remember specific conversations I had with people. Lines from movies? Oh, yeah. Lines from movies. I'm great. Ask me what I did yesterday, the other day before now. Hmm. At this age, I'm starting to forget. Yeah. When you go to this, you know, when you go on the road, you see some waitresses at some clubs. They're there every 18 months. You know, when you go to the fucking Funny Bone in Columbus, the manager with the glasses, she's great. She's been there for 30 something years. Yep. You know, so you recognize. Marcy. Marcy. The, the cook in Columbus, the big black drill. Sergeant. Right, right. You know, you just yeah. become. And, but you, have you ever gone to an improv and a waiter for the last four years? You've gone to Miami and he works in Miami. But all of a sudden, he transfers to the University of Tempe, and you do Tempe, and you see him, and he throws your whole fucking week off. Yeah. Because you're like, I know this motherfucker, but yeah. he should be in Miami. Where's the rest of the... I mean, that's the worst. Right. You know, we're at an age now where I try my hardest. I try my hardest. You know what? There's people I give hugs to and talk to, and I don't know their names at the comedy store. Yeah. There's two guys in particular that I get confused all the time. I just don't know their name. Fahi Mamwa. Yeah. I could say that all fucking day. Make him follow me. When I'm on stage, and I gotta you got to introduce him. him. Cannot bring yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the most embarrassing. I can uh, see Fahi Mamwa all uh -huh. fucking day long. Fahi Mamwa. Fahi Mamwa. Bring me up on stage. Yeah. When I go, Jeff, who's up next? Fahim Mamwa. I fucking, my insides crack. Yeah. Because I know. Or the worst is they just say Fahim. <coughs> they don't tell you the last name. And then sometimes you space on the last yeah, name. Yeah, that I brought you up. I said an intro about you. Yeah. And as I was doing the intro, <laughs> I was I almost forgot your name. <laughs> I'm just laughing because yeah. I, I, I did that to Eric, my like my best open mic buddy. The first time I did the belly room, I forgot his name as I was bringing him up. I thought it was just me. I'm glad to hear that you Dude, I used to be I used to be at an agency and uh and I had I had a few different agents. You know, they cover you one one person does TV, one person for your writing and another person books your stand up. So you got three different agents at one agency. And the woman that booked my acting, which was not a lot cuz I've never done a lot of acting, but she was my acting agent. And I was trying to do more you know, sitcom auditions and stuff. And uh she's black and I'm walking down the hallway with my stand-up agent, and, uh, and I see her, and I go, uh, hey, Robin, which is the assistant. I thought it was the assistant. I go, hey, Robin, which is the assistant's name. No, it was the agent. And she goes, no, I'm the other black woman in the office, your agent. And I was like, all right. And then I walked down the hall, I said to my stand-up agent, I go, I think I have to leave the agency. And I did, I switched agencies. Cause she, the look in her eyes, she was so fucking, she was so pissed off and I knew there was no recovery from it. I was kind of halfway out the door anyway. I use it as an excuse, but it was awkward. That's crazy. Yeah. Why can't we wear a name tag? I, yeah, I'm I love that. I'm ter I've been terrible at names. That was my, when I was a kid, I worked at movie theaters and CVS and you had name tags and then I went to restaurants no name tags. I worked there. Like it, it's it's. There's so many people. It's not even just because you guys. Imagine made a lot being of a teacher when you got. Oh my god. You know when you got five different classes a day coming in, thirty kids in each. It's 150 kids. You got to learn fast because by by week three, you got to know these fucking kids' names. Yeah. You know, there's like parent teacher conferences where these parents all come in. They want to know how their kids doing. You. <laughs> what, is, what does he look like? <laughs> Is he the one with the clunky glasses or the acne? I don't know. He seems to be doing all right. I don't know his name. What a shame that it's I, I. I wouldn't get mad at somebody if I still remember being an open micer and an MC and fucking up a credit and a comic just destroying me. Yeah. 
and me wanting to knock the motherfucker out, but he had every right to, but he was bombed anyway. I, I wouldn't want him to remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? You right. bombed anyway. What was the, yeah. They get off stage all mad at you. You fucked up. My, I was on NBC, not ABC. You know? Yeah. Doesn't matter. You were playing a fucking, you closed with a Tina Turner fucking song. <laughs> You know what, I'm saying? what are your chances? What are your chances? You're going to the deep, murky waters of a cruise ship. You, yeah. Where are you headed? You're not right. headed nowhere. Knock right. it off. Those are the people that I've, I've never forgotten. Yep. These people. Yeah. And it also taught me how to treat comics. Mm -hmm. Like now when comics come up to me, Mr. Diaz, what do you want us to say? Nothing. And their faces just drop. You say nothing? Nothing. Yeah. Really? I, I studied you at Wikipedia. I know everything, nothing. And they're like, and then afterward, they're like, thank God. You know, this is my eighth time on stage. I was all nervous. And I'm like, I'm not here to make you nervous. But I remember working with comics that came there purposely to make me nervous. And I think about them now, and that's why they ended up zeros. Yeah. Because they would abuse the feature and the fucking MC. You don't have to say nothing about me, bro. Yeah. I know. I remember being at your level. And having a hard time remembering what I had to say. Yeah. Now I got to remember seeing on the crocodile hunter with A and E. The, the show's not even on anymore. Yeah, right, right. Nobody cares. Yeah. It was a different generation. Yeah. yeah. They're know, already here. They're gotta, sitting in their seats. You, they're going to watch. You know, I worked, I began, I hope you don't think I'm cynical, people, but sometimes you have to be honest with yourself. I started as a host just to let people know at, at a broker. It was called the Broker Inn. And it was Tribbles, Colorado run. So Tuesday was Boulder. What a great start to a week. You're like, I'm in heaven. Oh. <laughs> and from there, Wednesday you got off. And Thursday you went to Craig, Colorado. And on the call sheet for the week, like they would fax you the call sheet for the week, it would have Tuesday, October 8th, Boulder. They would have the address, contact. Steve Harvey, you're to get one room and one voucher for a free meal, pick up partial payment, you'll pick up $65. And then for Craig, it would go Craig, Colorado, a Buck Hill Hotel. The bar is uh, six miles from the, the VFW Hall, and it would go, but it would be outlined in red. And it said, this room is active. If bottles erupt or violence run back to the hotel and contact <laughs> the club manager. Like, I'll never forget that. Yeah. Thursday was Gunnison and Saturday. For Friday was Gunnison and Saturday was Colorado Springs or something. But the, what the point I'm getting to is when you work those triple runs, and again, I'm not taking away from anybody, you work with a lot of frustrated headliners, especially from here. I worked with Doug Stanhope as a feature there. I worked with maybe out of all those days, 28 years ago, because this is when I had that, this job, my first two years of comedy. Still in the business today, I think there's maybe three of them. Whether they were feature acts, my age, there was three of them. And they're still on that same circuit, those three guys? Mm -hmm. They're still around. No, 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 no. Stan Hope is still around. There's one guy who was really hot because it just wasn't for broken down L.A. comics. It was also for comics on the upswing that wanted to work out material. So we got a lot of San Francisco guys that were really good young comics. But half the month, it was guys that they would walk in and tell you, how long you been doing it, kid? Six months. Quit now. To get to L.A., you got to suck dick. You got to be. It's run by faggots. Yeah. You know, they did, but they were just, and you could see that they were just broken men. Yeah. You could, even at that point, I would cater to them and be nice to them. But I could tell, like, that's where I met the guy that replaced Chico and the man. Oh, yeah? What do you think he felt like? Yeah. He went on to become a great script writer. Uh -huh. And he went on to teach acting class and stuff like that. But when I met him, he was in that transition. Like, he was a big shot at the store. You know, he was on NBC, and now he was working on triple runs. And that's a card hold, you know, that's a cold, hard reality yeah, of his business. Right. And you look at, you know, it's just a weird age. 
my age right now, I'll triple run guys. Like it was, I was working with a lot of guys my age yeah. now that I was in LA for 20 years and you got to be a fucking faggot and yeah. you got to suck dick and you got to do it. All the excuses. Mitzi Shaw doesn't know what she's doing. Yeah. Bud Friedman made me audition eight times to a catcher. And then you watch their act and you're like, are you fucking kidding me? Right. You People suck. put so much more effort into where they are, who's holding them back, what they need to do to get their social media. It was media, such a fucking, And not any on their fucking writing of their ads. It was such an education. Yeah. To meet the different. I'm going to tell you who else was very good. One of the headliners that did the best job ever. Tony something. He proclaimed to be Bill Hicks's sponsor. Tony Visage. Okay. He came into that broker one night and did an hour took the fucking roof off. I bumped into him years later and I gave him a big hug because he was very encouraging. He was Bill Hicks's alcohol sponsor before Hicks died. And he was around. He lives in Houston. I think he's still around Texas. Tony Visage. But besides that, all those comics disappeared. Yeah. I remember when we had the two-year anniversary. It was a big young comic from San Francisco who was very witty and very smart. And when I moved to L.A., I bumped into him. He lived around the block from me. And his roommate was one of those fucking knuckleheads that's still around here. He's working something. He's got to be doing something dumb. But he made a mistake one night. We were at the store. And I had been at the store maybe three years. And in those days, they used to have a room in Orange County. On Thursday nights, it was like an hour drive from here. It was a dinner theater. Do you remember that 20 years ago? No, nah, I wasn't around. Well, how long have you been in town? 20 years, but I didn't, I didn't start at the store. No, 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 no. About 20 years ago, there was a room in Orange County that was a dinner place. Oh, oh I thought it was one of the in store fact, locations. We did, in fact, I did it with Rogan about 10 years ago. Uh-huh. 20 years ago, it was very fucking popular. It was Thursday night. You had to take the 405 North and... uh cut somewhere i don't remember where it was and you had yeah the 405 south and then you had to take off it was like an hour fucking drive but it was big time to get that gig like the guy who booked it had left the other club igby's right whoever was booking igby's mm -hmm. was now the booker down there and it was a place that served you dinner it was a dinner theater place but on thursdays they did comedy and i mean everybody went down there and I remember, what the fuck is my point of the story? Uh, Talking ago. about a guy at the store approached you? Approached, guy who'd been oh, on yeah, that yeah, circuit? Yeah. So I'll never forget that that was the, he was some way in charge of booking that room. That's why he would go to the store on Friday night. Okay. And I'll never forget that one night he was buying Coke from Chewy. And so was I. And while we were standing buying the Coke from Chewy, Chewy said to me, Joey, that was a hell of a spot tonight. I go, thank you, Chewy. And the kid made a remark. He goes, I could follow him. And about a month later, they booked me in that room, and he had to follow me. Huh. And it was, if you think I buried Joe Apoto at the store, this was even worse. This kid was reaching. When he got on stage, he threw chairs and complained about me. <laughs> And I reminded him, I go, remember that night you said you could follow me? You learned a big lesson. He's still around. He's a half a mutage. I think he's giving Hollywood tours. You know what I'm saying? Like if you go to Hollywood. He's wearing a costume. And yeah. If you go on a Hollywood tour at yeah. 2 in the afternoon, he's got a red shirt yeah. on. You want to see where David Spade lives? <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Go suck my dick. I'll never forget him making that stupid remark. <laughs> and it had to be 1999. Yeah. Like, he just made a stupid... He goes, I bet I could follow him. Right. I'm just not a regular at the store, because Mitch, like, he, he wanted to be a regular. He would hang out down there and then give regular shit for being regular. Yeah, like that. yeah. There's no better feeling. I remember starting out with Rogan in Boston. There was there was a couple guys that had that attitude towards us. And then that was... That was <clears throat> all we did was it, it made you stronger. It made you go... I'm going to fucking bury that guy someday. Oh, yeah. You just that was the like greatest that. motivator to write new shit and to work on your edge and work on, you know, taking on an audience and figuring out how to 
get inside them, get inside them and fucking explode them from the inside, you know, to make contact with them. As a young comic, all you're doing is you're throwing shit at them. You're just, you're, 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 you're just like a, 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 it's a slap fight. You're not getting through. And then you start to develop your voice and then you start to develop your confidence and then you start to develop your understanding of what a crowd is. And then suddenly you find your way in. You find your way to, to, to connect to them in a way that they go, oh, this guy's in charge. They give over and you're the alpha. And then, the, and then you start to learn how to take that energy and fucking explode that crowd. And you can't, that takes time. It takes, it takes getting grounded on stage and not being afraid to bomb so you can take that risk to really show them who you are and connect. And that's when you, that's when you blow a guy off when the stage. When you talk about Rogan, what year were you guys talking about? 89, started around 89. And you guys 30 were years not ago. part of the clique at all. Well, Rogan was not at all. He was in no clique at all. And uh, I was, um, I, I played around with like Catch a Rising Star had like David Cross, Louis C.K., Janine DiTulio, Janine Garofalo, some of the like alternative people and some people that were John Groff, who's like one of the biggest showrunners in, in, in L.A. now. People that, Brian Kiley, people that are great writers were, were hanging out at Catch a Rising Star. And it was, there was a guy there, Robin Horton, who was like curating that vibe. It was in Harvard Square. So you had all these Harvard kids coming in and it was like David Cross did a thing called cross comedy where it was, do you ever see Mr. Show that he did with yes, Bob Odenkirk? Yeah. It was the, it was the predecessor to Mr. Show. So it was sketches mixed with some stand up and, you know, connecting sketches to each other in sort of like tangential ways. It was interesting. And I used to do spots over there. Rogan was, would never be caught dead over there. And they, they couldn't stand him. He couldn't stand them. And he kind of went out and, he wasn't he wasn't into it to make friends. He was into it to try to destroy. And I was like, him and I were were tight. We were we were going out on gigs together, like Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, every night. Never a fucking hotel. You would drive five hours up to Maine and they would hand you some cash at the end of the night, get back in the car in a fucking snowstorm and drive back to Boston. So we spent a lot of time in cars together. And uh and so we were tight, and there was a bunch of guys. Tom Cotter was part of our clique. Tom Cotter and Aldi Charm and uh, a guy named Mike McDonald who's down in Florida now. And uh, we were like more of like Kinnison fans, I think, and Hicks fans. And I think those guys were more like, um, you know, maybe Stephen Wright fans. And uh, so, but then you had the guys that were, the standards of Boston, Don Gavin, Steve Sweeney, and Lenny Clark, these guys never left Boston, but they could go, you put their name up in front of, there were, when we were starting out, there were six full-time clubs in downtown Boston. I'm really? talking seven nights a week, hot crowds, sold out. It was fucking, we were the luckiest comics in the world. We were, it's like uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about, you know, in, in Outliers, how, you know, whether whether or not the beat, you know, the Beatles started out because they, the happenstance of being able to play in Hamburg, Germany, where they had to play for six hours a night and they did it for weeks at a time, for years at a time. And that's how they got they logged. They say you got to do 10,000 hours before you get great at something. And we were in Boston playing in front of these great crowds downtown. Then we go out on the road and play tough saloons, hacklers. You know, working class factory people in Worcester, Massachusetts that were broke, drinking fucking punch out of those giant bowls with straws. The Aku Aku. The Aku Aku. I didn't know you knew that place. Fuck yeah. No shit. I performed there. Oh, not, fuck. It was hysterical because every time I did it, I did it with Tony V. Yeah, the and, greatest. And it was an experience because he said to me, uh, we play a game up here called Count the Puke Things. The puke circle. <laughs> because the Aku Aku would give you the punch bowls. Yeah. Scorpion bowls. The Scorpion bowls. The food right. was delicious. The yeah. brown, rice, yeah. brown rice yeah. and the shrimp and lobster sauce on yeah. fire. Yeah. And then you'd go up and perform, but by the end of the night, three people would puke. Oh, yeah. You know, and, yeah. It would, and it would be egg roll powder and the, the, the cabbage. Yeah. Mixed with fucking pineapple juice and it would stink to all hell. Yeah. Oh. And the Chinese guy would have the 
They don't have them no more. Rollers, <laughs> where it was like a box with yeah, a brush right, that right. sucks stuff oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Puerto Ricans use them and shit. And, like, you can't <laughs> fucking use them if you have, like, confetti because <laughs> they don't pick up confetti. These Chinese guys would be shit. pissed. I did the Aku Aku <laughs> 10 times from. I loved it. Oh, it's some fucking I greatest. loved it because Stanhope was from Worcester. Yeah. And I loved it because of the vibe it had. Yeah. Like when I first read about the Boston scene, about, like, I never, like, Joe Rogan had uh, Nick Lenny and. Lenny his, Clark his and his brother, brother Mike on. Clark. Yeah. I haven't listened to it yet. Yeah. But I loved all that. Like, listening to all those stories. Like, he told me a story that you guys used to play softball. Yeah. And he still Three days a week. Playing with Janine Garofalo. Yep. And him getting into an argument with fucking the joke, the, the check bouncer, Favorito. He's bouncing checks now. I in heard Boston. in Vegas. Yeah. No, Boston. He's back in Boston. They chased him out of Vegas. Went oh. to Boston. Started booking rooms. First week, Frank Santorini. From the Santorelli. And the Soprano showed up with the sunglasses. Boom, bounced a check on him, and it's been all downhill ever since. Before you know it, Vinny Favorito will be doing open mics in fucking uh, Massachusetts. Because he got bounced out of Boston. That's why he was in Vegas. He, he was teaching classes to comics, right. and he and collected the, all the he fucking took money. took all the money. Then he came out here. Yeah, he left with the money without and, teaching the class. And he didn't teach the class. Oh. The, the story about the benefit. Yeah, I heard that one, where too. Where they fucking... He, the, the waitress had the benefit. This is all allegedly. No, this is the people who told me were right on. Right. Remember, this is Club 56. The owner was the old Jew. Used to be called Chickland up on uh, Route 93 North. What, what next to, what's, what's, what, where's, where's fucking Jay Leno from? Uh, I don't know. This was the town that Nancy Kerrigan was from. Andover. Andover. Right. Andover, Mass. Yeah. That's where Jay Leno's from. Oh, is he? And it was Grill 93. And what was it? What was the restaurant Chick called? Chickland. Before Chickland. Oh, it was uh, called. I can't After, remember. From 99 to 2002, it became, he did a great job of their book and comedy. John Tobin. No, 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 no. It was this Jewish guy. Oh, yeah? And there was Dick Doherty. There was this Club 56. And then there was that, that place downtown, the famous place. And on Mondays, Nick's would, Comedy Stop? No, the bigger one. Comedy Connection? Yeah. Yes, and on Mondays I would go down there and the really cool guy would host, the Irish guy, God rest his soul. He's dead. He was good oh, friends Oh, Kevin with Knox? Kevin Knox. Yeah. And my, that was my route. Though. Yeah, no thinking, shit. Who the fuck do you think you're no dealing with? No shit, I, I was going that. up there as a feature act. Dude. And I would, Thursdays, a kid up there would get me like a gig in the neighborhood. And then Fridays and Saturdays, I would do 56. Sundays, they'd get me something in New Hampshire by the airport or something. Yeah. And then Monday, I would stay and go to the Comedy Connection. Yeah. And the guy with the gambling problem. Vinny Favorito? No, the other guy with the gambling The manager there had a gambling problem. Billy Downs? Whoever managed oh, that Paul place. Paul Barkley? Yes. Whoever okay. managed that place had a gambling problem. Yeah. The guy who got me into Boston was the guy that was an attorney that came out oh, here. Oh, Paul D'Angelo. Paul D'Angelo was the one who made the call for me. Right. Who's the gay guy from Boston? Really good looking, was out here for a while. Good friends with Chris McGuire. Sweetheart. Sweetheart of Jimmy Laletta? Jimmy Laletta. Yeah. They were all regulars at the store. Yeah, Great yeah, guy. right. What's the other guy that used to dress up like Dracula? Oh, Dom... Uh, Fig? Dominic Fig. Yeah. He's still he only comes on around Halloween now. Yeah, yeah. You got a fa you got a Facebook <laughs> message on Halloween. <laughs> I'm back if you want to. Dude, but that I, let me tell you about the, the Aku Aku in Worcester. I remember I used to play with Billy Burr. Billy used to back when he was Billy, he used to open for me. Little squeaky voice, Billy Burr. He was fucking sweet. He 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 wasn't as aggressive as he is now. He was just he was just a sweet kid. What year is this? Ninety three. 94 maybe and uh I, I drive out with him one week and uh i go up there's a place called cheapies donuts across the street from the aku aku and i just remember i remember the name because i thought when you're when you're shopping for donuts is cost is that is that big on your list that they're cheap donuts you just buy some fucking donuts so i buy a dozen donuts because i know how bad the late show friday is right so I, I figure i'll give out some treats i'll keep i'll keep them fucking focused 
So I go up there <laughs> and I go up and uh, and I do this bit. I used to have this bit where it was I would read a deadbeat Father's Day card written to a deadbeat dad. So I'm, I'm reading the card and some guy in the back stands up and he goes, hey, I'm a deadbeat dad and I don't appreciate that. And so a guy in front of him turns around and he goes, shut up and sit down, asshole. Now, two parties of Worcester guys, fucking hair slicked back. They still got their varsity jackets on, even though they're in their 40s. They're drinking those fucking scorpion bowls and they collapse on each other like a rugby match and shit. Tables are flying. People are throwing fucking plates. They call they call the police and I stay on stage. I'm calling it like a fight. He hits him with a left. Oh, he's down. Watch out for the scorpion bowl. Oh, he's got your back, brother. Don't worry about it. Smitty's here. And then they keep fighting. The fight went on so fucking long that the police showed up and the fight was still. It was like a seven minute fight. Just rolling around the room. And they had those xylophone doors. They broke through the xylophone door. And then they start dragging guys out. The donuts they, didn't help. And then the don't know. So then they all fucking leave. And now the crowd is in disarray. And people's drinks are knocked over. And I just start handing out donuts. I'm like, it's gonna be all right, everybody. We're gonna I got twenty minutes left. We're gonna finish this shit up. And then like you said before. Chick in the front row throws up on the stage. Oh my god! Just when you think it couldn't get worse, she throws up on the stage. Everybody threw up there. <laughs> Everybody threw up there. Guaranteed yeah. three throw ups. Yeah. The Chinese waiters they were like used to it. Yeah. Well, I was gonna add, did they, did they card back then, or was that like high school kids? No, uh, it was a mix of underage kids, and you know Worcester's like a dilapidated, like defunct factory town. All those factories are out of business. And a lot of people are on welfare. It's 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 taking a tick up lately. They're coming back, but it was a sad fucking place. Just big brick factories with no fucking smoke coming out of those smokestacks. They're cold, cold factories with sad people. I gotta be honest with you. For a guy like me, and you're gonna be in shock when it. At the time, being a regular at the comedy store. And being able to perform in Boston, I thought I was a movie star. Yeah. Once I had accomplished those two things, even if it was an open mic at the comedy connection, connection that was one of my all time favorite. Yeah, clubs. that was a fucking. Is it the top of Annual Hall, right? That was yeah. That wow. was that was. You uh, could rock that place. I still remember going there for the weekend with Rogan and just being in heaven, just eating downstairs. Yeah. Going across the street to the hotel, we did a two-day stint where all we did was me, him, Eddie, and and that's what, you know, I mean, God bless him. We were broke. Yeah. Joe would pay for everything. We were eating lobster claws, that fear fact of money. We were tearing that shit up, <laughs> Jack. That, he was taking care of all of us with that fear fact yeah. of money, and it was just. Uh, and there was a lot of coke floating around in those days. I, both nights I disappeared in yeah. those days. <laughs> yeah. Once Joe got off the show, the second he go, where's Diaz? Fuck, he left again. <laughs> they would start, because I didn't have a call or phone. I would have a pager. Yeah. Yeah. My page would be blowing up. I'd just turn it <laughs> off. I'd put no bother in the room. I'd get back to the hotel and make me change rooms. <laughs> so Rogan would think I was in 208. I'd make him change me room because I don't want nobody knocking on my door. I would disappear. Dude, it, they used to pay people in Coke. They'd give you a $100 packet of Coke after you set. That was, this, and guys would do it at the bar. There was not making this up, and there's a film about it. It's called When Stand Up Stood Out, and it's about Boston back in the 80s. Where, where is it? Where is it at? Because I saw it. It's on YouTube. I think I think you watch it on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah, guy yeah, Fran yeah. Salamita made it. Yes. And it's about how much Coke was around <clears> in those days, and that the comics actually staged a protest because... The club owner told them at the the old Comedy Connection, which was on Warrington Street, told them they couldn't do lines at the bar while the show was going on. But they wanted to watch <laughs> the other comics because they were all they were all doing new shit every night, fucking around, and they wanted to see each other and do blow. And they they told them they couldn't, and so they picketed. They refused to do the club, and they had to give in and go. All right, fine, you guys can do coke wow. at the bar. I'm not sure if that's in the movie, but it's about that time. Now, now, while you're up there with Rogan, Dane Cook's already at the Comedy Connection. He was an improv. He did stand up in front of an improv prop troupe. I heard. Yeah, they were called. Uh, they were called. Uh, um, 
God, I can't remember the name, but it was Bobby Kelly and uh, and Dane, and I think one other kid. Might have been two other kids, but it was definitely definitely Bobby and Dane. Uh, uh, something in the Monkeys, Al and the Monkeys, it was called, and they used to go up, and they were silly because like the thing about Boston is you really could do anything because it was a closed community. So there wasn't a lot of people that came to town. Like you're a rarity. Not many people no, were brought was, into that Boston. That wasn't allowed. It was that very was, rare. I had to beg that guy. Yeah. He paid me break even money yeah. because he goes, I'm loaded with features. That's right. What do I need you for? Yeah. You so, didn't need me at all. So you're in a world where you have to be different than the other hundred comics in town. If you had the same voice as somebody else, they'd come down on you. It was not, it was not acceptable. So it forced people to develop their own thing. And so Alan the Monkeys was like the only sketch group I'd ever seen in Boston. Nobody else did it. And uh, and so, uh, and then they branched out and started doing their own thing. But uh, I think they felt, they felt hacky, but uh, I thought they were funny. You know, they were goofballs. That's just a great, you know, looking back. Like that was just a great scene of town. Yeah. You, Dane Cook, Janine. Bill Burr, Patrice O'Neill. Patrice was in Boston too. Louis C.K., yep. Yeah. Louis C.K., Mark Marin. Um And Marin was already a veteran. Well, Marin Marin, Dave Cross, Louis, they all started about two years ahead of uh me and Rogan. And then uh me and Rogan's class was like us. Billy was a couple years after us, Bobby Kelly was a couple years after us. Patrice was a few years after us. And then, um, yeah. And then there were guys, like I said, so many guys that went on to be big writers. Brian Kiley, who I think is the best writer I've ever met, has been writing monologue jokes for Conan since day one. Every fucking day for 25 years. That dude shows up, sharpens his pencil, and writes 50 fucking monologue jokes. And he's a machine. And you got to read his Twitter feed. Brian Kiley. K-I-L-E-Y. Check out his Twitter feed. Fucking golden jokes every day. And he came out of that. Like I said, Jonathan Groff came out of that. Um, and then you got, you know, guys that never left, but that are some of the comics I consider the best comics I've ever seen. Don Gavin, Steve Sweeney, uh, Lenny Clark. Um, uh, you mentioned him before. Tony V. Mike Donovan. Guys that fucking destroy that are craftsmen that are beautiful jokes timing and they have personas that are unlike anybody you've ever seen before so crowds in boston are always good to this day it's my, my best market i go back i sell out all my shows rocking crowds it's it's still an amazing place to do stand up i'm, I'm just interested to think, see what you think happened because i'm from there and i remember early high school they still had the comedy connection on top of faneuil hall but then that closed, and through college there was literally nothing. Like I, yeah. I, I left before Laugh Boston opened, so like it, it seemed like there was like a ten years or something where there was literally not a comedy club. Yeah, there was a guy that came in, and uh, I'm not gonna say his name, but he had one of the bigger clubs, and he started running the other clubs out of business on purpose. He was buying up a lot of advertising in the local paper, telling comics if they worked the other place, they couldn't work his place bringing in out-of-town headliners, changed the whole table, reset the table, changed the scene, and started paying the opening acts, the feature acts, no money at all. And so a lot of good comics left town because of that or just stopped doing it. It was bad It was bad for the city, but now the city's having a resurgence. This guy named John Tobin, who runs Laugh Boston, is fucking great dude. Great dude. Knows comedy. Great club. And he goes back to that club you were talking about, the Grill 93. Yeah. The, uh, the, um, uh, what was it called? Uh, the club we were talking about before, where Vinny. Yeah, yeah. Like he that. he was he started out as a door guy there. Then he became the manager. Then he started booking clubs downtown, and now he's got rooms all over the place. He's got a room in Worcester. He's got one in Springfield. He's got one in I think Cape Cod, and he's opened them all over the place. And this guy's really fucking sharp. And they, so there's there's been a real good bounce back. Well, you have an interesting, like I loved my open mic story. Like I loved it. Yeah. Like, looking back on it, I really enjoyed myself. Like, I had, in Denver, remember, I got on stage when Roseanne was the queen. And she had just left Denver, maybe, four years. So, yeah. Rose, Denver was hot. Roseanne left heat. 
you know, people were looking at Denver. You had Steve McGrew. Yeah. Who at the time, you know, he just missed the boat. He was just too late for the boat on so many different levels. But he had three different hours. You work with Steve McGrew. Oh, yeah. In one week, he has three different hours. Yeah, yeah, hours. right. And you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, so it was Todd Jordan and Rick Kearns. And they had this big thing going. You got the comedy works, you know. Once I got banned from the comedy works, it was forced my hand to go to Seattle. That's why I hooked up with Josh Wolf and Brody Stevens. And that was a scene that, it made me who I am today. That comedy underground was right. a phenomenal club. Right. And it's so weird. You look back and you see that Josh Wolf is still in the business. And, you know, Brody would have still been in the business. I mean, you look at the percentages. I mean, with you, it's, you know, Patrice O'Neill, God rest his soul. But it's Patrice, Burr, Dane, Robert Kelly, Rogan, Janine still doing something. Yeah, David Cross. He they always throw him a fucking show that's gonna get canceled. Right. You know, <laughs> Marin. Yeah. Solid. Marin. Marin Louis. Solid. Louis. Solid. You know. Louis and just solid. And the that's generation it. before us, you had fucking Stephen Wright. You had, uh, you, you had uh, Jay Leno, Paula Poundstone, Kevin Meany, Lenny Clark. Lenny Clark. Lenny Clark was dice pushed me on stage. Lenny Clark taught me how to add class. Like, I saw that picture of him, Rogan, and his brother. Yeah. And I still remember I used to shop at Fashion Barn when I was a car salesman. They had, you know, suits, and then they had Off the Rack. I bought Off the Rack. I became friends with the guy. The guy's name was Bob Schultz. Great guy. Jewish guy from Brooklyn. Always had a Jew story. Always had a great racist fucking black joke. <laughs> I remember being friends with him when the blacks went to war with the Jews in the Bronx uh -huh. in like 93. And I'll never forget going into Fashion Bar and there were white people all over. And he's like, thank God we're beating up those fucking whatever they call black people. He was just yelling it in Boulder. Yeah. He goes, they were, we're fucking fucking them up. And like, I don't know, some part of Bushwick, somewhere in Brooklyn, Yeah, blacks got into it with Jews. And he was talking about it. But anyway, to make a long story short. Oh, oh I know what it was. It was when that, that Jewish guy got, 92. He got he got 90, chased through the streets. He got right. hit by a car and died. And then there was like race wars after. Right, 91, It wasn't Bushwick. It, it was uh, uh, out by Coney Island. What's that area? Whatever. Whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was 91, 92. And when I saw him go off, I took a liking to him. Yeah. I always bought off the rack there. When I saw Lenny Clark and his Rodney Dangerfield special, I had just gotten separated. We were just talking about this the other day, and I didn't give a fuck. I went in there, and I went, Bob, take the card. Today, we're going over to the real suits. And I bought, like, four fucking suits at the time, 1987. Let's say there was 600 apiece. And I started wearing suits because of Lenny, but I started bombing even more. Yeah. Like, I was on a bombing streak. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I'm doing comedy three years. I see Lenny. He inspires me to take it a different way. Now I'm doing a combination of Dice, Lenny, and Kennison. And I'm sprinkling in the little hicks in there, right? And I still got the prior element going. But I pushed the Lenny as much as I could with the suit. But the percentage of bombings, I had a notebook in those days. And I remember every time I wore a suit, it was just bomb. Yeah. Bomb. Bomb. Are you bomb. logged how you did each time? Oh, you have to. Okay. I had to. I had to. If you know anything about me, I'm Captain fucking Records. So yeah. everything gets logged in, how much I got paid, who else went on stage, how the joke I did tried, or I would write, fuck you, you suck, quit. <laughs> You're just a sack of shit, criminal. You're never going to amount to anything. Yeah. I mean, I would just torment myself. Wow. The, you still have all those notebooks? Yeah. Yeah. Shit, I would love to read. I think I'm those. missing. Uh, I'm missing ninety-seven through ninety-nine. That's when I, I my car got towed. Okay, and it took like two years of notebooks. Yeah, and those were really interesting because those were my first two years. In right, LA and what I was feeling, and I would write like I would. I would be brutally honest. Would you write down if you'd done coke that night or anything? You could see it in the handwriting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> When he's logging in at 4.30 yeah, in the morning. You can see the ink fucking. No, yeah. no, there was no computer. 
Everything was done by hand. Yeah. All these notebooks were October 8th, Comedy Store, Sam Tripoli show. I, and then I would put 15 minutes. I tried a new joke, but I bombed. What do I expect? How much work do I put into this? I suck. 10 o'clock show. Uh, did a lot better. I redeemed myself. It's time you put a little bit more effort into this. I got paid 15 bucks. Sam Tripoli, Kevin Fitzgerald, and uh, Lee Syatt were on the show. I just, just to cover my ass. Yeah. Somebody once told me, just, just, whatever, just as a log. And then at the end of the month, I would take the page and go, I did 22 sets. My goal for next month is 27 sets. I did 26 sets. I bombed 21 times. I did okay 20, uh, three times, and I did excellent three times. If I don't pick this number up by this date, I should just shoot myself. Like, I was that. <laughs> Honest, like yeah. You, you well, they re- say success comes from writing down your goals. That's, That's the it. thing Constantly. you read every day, every, every day, all the every time. Day. You read that. Write so down your goals. When I walk in the door at ten o'clock at night, whether my wife is up, the baby, that's fine. I'm fifty-six, and I still have the same habit I had ten years ago. Even without the coke, I'm doing the same things I did at night when I walk in from doing a set that I did with. Only accept the Coke. So I walk in, I pee. I wash my hands, I get the comedy store off of me. I, you know, whatever, I get a beer, I get not a beer, but I get like a water. I'll do a few bong hits, and then I'll open up that notebook. That's the first thing I do. There's nothing else you have to do. Yeah. Go to the notebook. Go to the set list you had that you were gonna do, that new joke you were gonna try, I didn't try it. So now you have something to complain about. Yeah. So tonight I'll write October 8th, Sam Tripoli's show. I'll write what he paid me and how I did. And then the original room show, obviously the set's going to be different. So I'm going to write what I did differently. And once I do that, then I go to the journal side of the notebook. And I close out my day. How was my day today? I did this, I did this, I spent time with my family. You know what I'm saying? Just to always keep that dialogue. Right. That's great. You know, at this point right now, the performance is there. You know, I could still bat 327 on any given night. I just need to write. You know, I don't have to perform as much as I had to 10 years ago. I could just write and get the same result. Mm-hmm. But this is what works for me now. When I was, when you know, when you first got into it, I didn't watch TV for the first 10 years of comedy. I didn't even know what a TV was. I watched MTV in the daytime. Night. I didn't know. It did. And you watch Seinfeld? Yeah, I know. I remember you know, never seeing Seinfeld and everybody know. was talking about it. I never watched Friends. I didn't watch TV. That's didn't right. Watch Friends. Yep, never saw an episode of Friends. If you're a real comic, you don't know anything yeah. about what's on TV. If you're real. Yeah. You have no idea. You and you missed your cousin's yeah. wedding and you missed your buddy's 30th birthday party. You don't know in the nothing. cape. You didn't do that. It's really weird when you try to still try to be normal during an open mic because you can't. Yeah. Because you have to force your principles to think that way. Mm-hmm. Like everything's a no. Like what are you doing Saturday, November 14th? Your uncles are getting together. Good. Send them time to go fuck themselves. Yeah, right. I'm not going. You know. And, there's, and the thing is, is it wasn't even a discipline. It was just, in my mind, going to Long Island to my cousin's wedding just never felt like no, but I'm getting spots to stand up in New York. They're giving me fucking three spots on a Saturday night. I used to f- I used to drive from New York, from Boston. I would finish my sets on a Saturday night at the Aku Aku in Worcester. Late show, get get off stage at, at midnight. I'd get in the car, and I would drive three and a half hours. I would get to New York at 3.30 in the morning. I'd crash on friends' couches. It was always a hassle. Calling friends, hey, can I stay at your place? Can I stay at your place? Wearing out the fucking welcome mat at all your friends' places. Having nights where you couldn't find a place to stay. And so you go down and you get a hotel that you can't afford. And you stay there all so you can hang out at a club and maybe get a spot at 1.30 in the morning. I did that for two years. And when I finally broke in and I moved to New York and I was getting three, four, five sets a night, 100 bucks a spot, and I get invited to a cousin's wedding in Long Island. Not even a thought, not even an option. 
I'm so fucking excited to do those shows. It's everything. It's sexual. It's physical. It's mental. It's creative. It's this inflow of energy and acceptance from the crowd that you've never had before. And you're doing it in the most romantic city in the world. You're in fucking New York City on the pavement, hailing cabs to get across town and run in, do a set, get out, grab a bagel and a light and sweet coffee from a deli, go down to the village, walk past fucking homeless people and street musicians so you can duck into the basement of a club, pull out your piece of paper before you go on, do your new shit. At the end of the night, you got fucking 600 bucks cash in your pocket and you're at a friend's couch knocking at the door at fucking two in the morning. Hey, guys. Hey, how was your night? It was great. I fucking did six shows. I want to hear every detail. They think it's the most fascinating thing. That or sit at a table with a friend of the bride and make small talk? Oh. Come on. This goes back to the other night I was in the main room and I said, I have to be honest with you people. You know, it's like uh, people who don't have kids really don't understand. Then you get it. I still remember Ralphie telling me, I can't meet you tonight. I have to stay home with the kids. And be mm. like, what are you talking about? <clears throat> You're Ralphie May. Fuck your kids. I regret that so much now. Yeah. Because I'm so the opposite. Let me tell you something. I'm telling you, Lee, and the people in the fucking podcastville. In reality, when I was 20, I really didn't. and be honest with you. If you really think I gave a fuck, boy, were you wrong. At 56 with a child, I really don't give a fuck. Like, I really don't give a fuck. It's so weird. And that's why we started this conversation off with the, you know, why don't I want to ever go to the Friars Club? Is it insecurity? Is it that I don't belong there? Like, I don't know. Like, whenever I see, like, pictures of the old comedians, what's that fucking guy's name that was an analyzed that, that played the gangster? He's an old-time guy. He was also in Casino. He tells the old guy if he... Bobby got... Slayton? No, fucking Bobby Slayton was in Casino. Wasn't he? he? No. He was the old guy that told Alan King. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Alan King always hangs out the Friars. He looks like a Friars guy. He was right? the dean. Right. He looked like him. Yeah. Every time I see him, he's got like that. I don't know. It just has. And I'm not insulting you in any way, Greg. This is how I feel. It just it just wouldn't be a place that I'd fit in. Right. I don't know why. But I know that going in. It's like this weed cafe. Yeah. I don't fit in there. But Alan King, when my dad died after being a member of the Friars Club for fucking 30 years... That place wept for him. Alan King did the memorial for my dad. He hosted no it. And he got up and he cried talking about my dad. It was beautiful. And so, all, so what did your dad do? He was a radio guy. No shit. Yeah, he up was, in Boston, New York? No, New York. He was a Bronx guy. Spent his entire life living in New York. And he did- uh, so I must listen to him. Yeah, I'm sure you did. He was, he was Sinatra. He played Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Vic Damone, fucking Aretha Franklin- what station was it? WNEW. Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah. And WNEW played rock. Well, there was they? FM and AM. He was on AM. Okay. The FM side. The FM side was. What was the girl's name? Oh, she's still around. Uh, nope. Meg Meg Griffin. She had like that oh, distinct voice. Oh, Allison Steele. The Is night, the night bird. Steele? Allison Steele. She was best friends with, uh, uh, what's her name from um, Jefferson Airplane? Grace Slick. That was her best friend. The two of them were fucking the rock and roll kings in New York, queens in New York. And she would, she would do the, the, it's the night owl, Allison Steele. You know, like I heard all those, like the only place, like people always ask stupid questions on Facebook. Like what celebrities <laughs> would you want to get high with? None of them. You know, none of them. Wait, who do you want to get high with? None of them. Like this, people are like, oh, don't you want to get high with Snoop Dogg? Oh, yeah, I'm dying to get high with Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Leave me the fuck alone. Grow, grow the fuck up. Don't you want to get high with DJ Khalid? Oh, yeah, it's on my bucket list. The fuck? I don't want to get high with nobody, all right? Leave me the fuck alone. 
But <coughs> I wish I could have a conversation with like Jackie Gleason. Mm. You know, like that. That's the, in a regular bar. Yeah. I don't need to belong to some fucking organization to mm. talk to. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm one of those guys. I just, the other day I took my daughter to swimming right here at NoHo. So we have a Saturday class we go to. And before I got there, my wife uh, called me. She goes, you know, there's no parking. And I go, what do you mean there's no parking? I pulled in, and there was a parking. And I parked right in, and I'm getting out of the car. Some little Mexican says, excuse me, excuse me. You know me, I play deaf. Mm. I don't stop for nobody. Yeah. I just keep walking. I know the guy gave up. Yeah. And he just <laughs> let me park there. So, <laughs> you don't know nothing. When he's yelling, you just keep walking like you own the joint. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. I just kept walking. I walked into the Y. I don't think his ice paperwork is up to date. So he couldn't go into the Y with me. You yeah, he's saying? not going to dig in. No, he couldn't dig in. So please. Uh, so. Uh, so what's that have to do with I not going to a club? I, I sit down and my wife goes, there's no way. No, my wife is like the queen of panic. There's no parking anywhere. I say I'm parked right there. Yeah. She goes, well, the valet. I go, who gives a fuck about the valet? Why do you fucking buy into this shit? And the guy <laughs> behind her goes, oh, yeah, because it's next to the Masons. Oh. So she goes, the guy goes, the Illuminati is having a meeting, so they rented out both parking lots. I go, you know what? Those people over there can suck my dick. One night, <laughs> me and we a stone to the gills with our friend. Our, our, one of Lee's great friends, gay guy, who was hilarious. Oh, the one you met. With Boys Ahoy. Oh, yeah, right, right. Eric. Yeah. He's been on the podcast. Okay, so yeah. we'll, we'll drive down 7-Eleven Street, whatever, that, that Coenga. We're just going Tunga. to do something. We're going to eat pizza. We're going to do something. We we're coming from the ice house, and we're driving, and they're all out there, the Masons, <laughs> and there's a bunch of torches, and they're standing out in the front, like, saluting each other, whatever the Nazi <laughs> thing is, and all of a sudden, I beep the horn, and I go, what did I say to them? Something like so, vote for me, suck my. Like, I don't yeah, know, I like, <laughs> vote for me, cocksuckers. <laughs> and they all were like, Shut. and the best part is he turned around and did it again. <laughs> I had to make a U turn. And, <laughs> and they're standing up there like, oh yeah, I love this French souffle. And I'm like, beep, beep. Go fuck yourselves, you cocksucker. And they had security out there. They had them on the walking talkies. I was tormenting them. We were howling. I almost crashed the car. I was dying so much because white people cannot handle that shit. <laughs> when you beep them. The Illuminati. Like, I still <laughs> I still remember being 18 and being in the car with my best friend, Roger. Okay. And he had a Chrysler New Yorker, 1982, brand new. And we would cruise in the afternoon, and he was the king of beeping and saying shit to people like, <laughs> at the bus stop. Ha ha, you hot, huh, cocksucker? Yeah. No hablo next time. Get immigration. He'd take off. Yeah. He'd just say things to people. Yeah. Right. And I'll never forget that one day. <laughs> we were driving. You know, all of a sudden when your car stops, like a car in front of you stops, and now everybody's like doing like eight. Everybody was doing 60. Now you're doing eight. It's because a family was leaving. And they were getting in the car. <laughs> and another family was waving to them. Like they're like, okay. Yeah. Good luck. I'll never forget Roger pulling up to the family going, beep, beep. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> there was kids, grandmas, grandpas. <laughs> they're all waving. And my friend's like, Fuck you, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these He's kids. just an agent of chaos. Oh, my God. And I love seeing people walk. Leo, tell you. Yeah. I see you walk on Lancashire at night with your head down. I'll beep at you and say something to you. You got to see people. <laughs> the best is when he gets me high, and then he's on the on the highway beeping at people. <laughs> Oh, when you beeping yeah. people at the highway, it's hysterical. <laughs> on the 134, 
Yeah. You know, There's not a lot of smart people on 134. No, no. If you had it that way, you're pretty stupid fuck. Yeah. <laughs> one way or another. You know what I'm saying? You failed to get on the 101 or the 405. Yeah, 405 is like the hip people. Yeah. 101, they're the hip people. That's why they're in trap. Yeah. They got time to burn. If you're on the 134, you're in retard bill. You're going up by USC. They got, <laughs> they got to pay their kids to get into the school. Lynch Juan retired all of a sudden. Because that shit's going to go down. There's no bigger fucking payola school in USC. Oh, than yeah. Hollywood fucking. Oh, yeah. Not just payola, but kids. that, but the uh, legacy. You know, if your parent went, all of a sudden you get in automatically. What the fuck is that all about? How 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 do I get knocked out? I worked my ass off in high school. I joined the fucking Model UN Club, and I went to fucking Tokyo to debate global warming with a bunch of kids from around the world. Did you really? No, I'm just saying. Like, if I'm that kid, <laughs> if I wasted my fucking weekend... So I could go and pretend I'm in the UN so I could get credit towards college, get fucking straight A's, not even A's anymore. You got to get a 4.3. There's no more 4.0. Now it's like, because when you take an AP class, you get extra points. And my kid, uh, I'm doing a, can I do the joke I'm doing on stage about it? Can, well, I, can I do a joke? Do whatever the fuck you want. Who am I? What am I? So my kid just, my kid just got into college and, uh. You know, I was actually kind of surprised because he's not not that bright of a kid. He had all D's and C's, really low SAT scores. So we had to hire one of those fancy Hollywood college placement centers, $175,000. But he got into USC. He's on the rowing team, which is exciting because he's never rowed before. And we just told him his Indian name is uh, Him Row Slow. <laughs> It never works, but I fucking love it. <laughs> I do it every night. <laughs> I th you you had me there for a minute. I yeah. thought you did pay an enrichment center one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. I listen. If you come to me with that scam, I'm dropping my daughter at Ralph's. You get the job because one seventy five to get you into college yeah, right. is not worth the fucking right. aggravate. It's really no. not. No, there was just this article. We actually hired this. This woman, she works with a lot of kids at, uh, my kid went to uh, Santa Monica High School, big big public high school, very diverse. And so they actually look for kids from that school because they want, they actually want diversity of states and they want specifically kids that can handle like that kind of uh, community. So we hired this woman, it cost two grand and she went out and she knows every fucking school in the country. She knows which ones have good professors, good programs, the ones that right, they, they give your kid an assessment test, figure out what his strengths are, help him find a major, locate schools that, that, are, that are a good value for the money and that are giving money to kids just because they're from certain types of schools. So we worked with her for six months. She, she gave us a list of schools, flew them out. Me and him would take these fucking weekends, Boston one weekend, Chicago one weekend, New York one weekend, Philly one weekend, having a blast. He's got fake ID. I'm taking him to bars. We'd go to whatever the college bar was for that college because I said, I want you to see what, it's gonna, what your nightlife's going to be like. So we go in, me and him at a college bar, fucking 53-year-old ball guy standing around while kids are doing jello shots. And my son is just taking it all in, talking to some girls, feeling it out. That's what we did every fucking weekend for like, for like a month. It was great. And uh, so we found this school in Chicago. It's going to DePaul University. Biggest Catholic school in DePaul? the country. DePaul. DePaul. Yeah. Great basketball program. Yeah, they won the they they were in the finals, the NCAAs one year. All the, the Division Jersey. I school. Camden Connection. Right. That's what they were called. The That's Camden right. Connection. Yeah. They were all from Camden. So he's got this school and they give him a fucking chunk of money. And it's not an expensive school, but it's a great school. It's a great school. And uh He's loving life. He's fucking living it up. He's up there. He's got his roommates are, uh, he's got three roommates. They're all African-American. Uh, half the floor is gay. He's on a gay floor for whatever reason. They put him on that. And he's hanging out with these gay kids every night till three o'clock in the morning. They're watching fucking movie marathons or playing board games. And then, you know, he goes out to Boys Town, which is the gay area of Chicago. I go, what'd you do last night? He goes, yeah, I was out to, I was out in Boys Town till four in the morning. I go, are you going to dance on the dark side, son? He's like, I don't know, Dad. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so he's gonna, he's getting a good education. He's living it up. You know, and you have a daughter also. Yes, yeah, she's 16. Okay, so now you have to go through this shit in yeah. another year and a half. Right, right, right. So welcome to it all over again. Yep. Yeah, this is this is what it's all about. 
That's yeah. what it's all the about. The final stages. And I really applaud you because you've pulled it off while doing your craft. Which right. A lot of people say, fuck it, I'm just going to raise my family and not do this shit. Hmm. You played the card the right way, and I commend you for it. Thanks, man. You looked around. You, you saw kids of forgotten comics from years ago and how fucked up they are. You know, when you talk to comics kids or they tell you, there's something missing there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that for my daughter at all either. I told her yesterday in the car, there was a little problem yesterday at the at the self-defense school. Some little girl said something to one of the teachers, and I asked my daughter, what did she say? She, goes, she said a bad word. And I go, you know, I don't need this mercy. Like, I could be anywhere. I could be at a Dodger game. But I could be on the road making money, but I work my schedule the way I do to spend time with you. You know, we lose money, guys like you and I, to spend time oh, with yeah. kids. You yeah. Know, fuck Halloween. Today somebody just called me. We need you October 31st. Nope. I think I'm Never have, work on Halloween. Just cancel it. Nope. I'm doing the David Spade show on the 30th, though. Oh, nice. It's 1 30 in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. I'm back over the hill by 4 30. Right. Stop at Joe's Pizza. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. great. They shoot in Hollywood. So that shit I don't mind, but I'm not doing nothing on Halloween. Halloween, Valentine's Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, school concerts, Mother's fucking Day, plays. Mother's Day, Father's Day. Mother's Day, I, Father's Day. I already Day. got the, I look at the year before, I put them all on dates. Right. And I ship them to the agent. And I go, don't book on that date. There's yeah. no office. Don't even worry about it. But they want you to that day. We'll tell them it's going to have to be a different day because mm -hmm. it's Mother's Day. Yeah. It's Father's Day. I chose this way. I could go on the road every fucking weekend like, a, like an animal. But you know what? I'd much rather her know who the fuck I am. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you're a good dad. You spent a lot of quality time with her. Hey, listen. I'm going to leave here now. Go run some errands. And I'm back here doing a podcast, science podcast with her. You're doing a what? I do a science podcast with her. With who? With my daughter. No. Yeah, we, I don't put them up because it's fucking bad. But it's just her talking about science. Today. On the microphone? Yeah, I put the earphones on. No shit. I make believe she's on oh, CBS. That's fucking In great. In her mind, she's on ESPN. That's great. How old is she now? Six. Then oh, go my back, God. We go back and meet her and her mother watch it on the phone. Her mother downloads it. And we watch oh it. my God! Say, you think kids watched it? Yeah. How many views? Two million. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so she thinks she's on. She thinks she's on fucking NBC. She's like, well, when do I start doing the reads for Stamps.com? I started them, so I give her twenty a month, five dollars a week. Really? Yeah, I sponsor her. The church of what's happened now. You got to give ten to your mother for the bank account, and you keep ten. I love it. That's it. When you want to see a toy you want, you don't need us. You spend, yeah. you got your own $10. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which you'll know it's like I'm undercutting her tremendously, <laughs> but you can't give them everything. But you got to teach them the value of a dollar. Once she's know? 18, you should you should post those. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. she'll post them way before that. My wife yeah. downloads them. Yeah. They're in the cloud. They're in this. They're in that. I mean, that's, you know, for years... I was under the illusion that it was about money. That's what we spoke about Monday. Money, that everything. Oh, if you have a child. I'll never forget when I had my first child, a daughter that doesn't talk to me, for her third birthday, guess what this fucking idiot did? Why? Guess what I bought for her third birthday party and I invited a bunch of white kids to her party? What? A $150 paella. I'm sure the parents loved you. <laughs> yeah, right. It three sounds like the, a good party. Three of the parents ate it. Everybody was looking for fish sticks, oh, right. pizza from Domino's, right, right. and little chicken fucking, you don't even know if it's a rat or a mouse yeah. or whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> yeah. I was in shock because I was, my mom would have these huge birthday parties for me, you know, with a band and a pinata and 200 people. And I thought it was, all they want to do is just your time. Mm -hmm. That's all they want. They don't know anything about money. I think of the Menchies, whatever, they get yoga. <clears throat> That's my most expensive date with her. Last night after karate, we went to Yum Yum Donuts. I get the brand muffin because I'm an old man. I got a shit blood. Uh -huh. And she gets the blue donut with sprinkles and we watch Descendants 3. <laughs> and then I got to fucking give her a kiss, tell her good night. 
I'm going down to the store to rip into some fucking assholes like a <laughs> savage. It's like being in the mafia. Yeah. I eat dinner with her, she prays, yeah. and she doesn't know in two hours I'm going to be at the store talking about eating my wife's asshole and how I don't get fucking the flu because I eat my wife's asshole. That's my fucking life. Welcome to my fucking world. You got any dates coming up? Oh, yeah. You kidding me? Uh-oh. He's Working going into hard. the fucking yeah, notebook. My, uh... He's working the well, fucking let me scroll. Tell you something. You wanna, if you want to check him out, you go to fitzdog.com for tickets. I'm working uh, Oh, my favorite club in the country, San Francisco Punchline. Almost went out of business, but they're back November 8th through the uh, thir- no, I'm sorry, the 7th through the 9th. Then I'm going to be going out to the KC Improv November 15th through 17th. Then I'll be at the Denver Comedy Works downtown November 21 through 23. Then I'm going to be hitting the... Uh, Greg, Greg, Greg. Just give them two or three days. Right. You know, Cincinnati. Fucking, we think they're sitting there with a feather. Uh, with <laughs> the Philly, Cincinnati. Thing. It's all on fitzdog.com. Man, you got a heavy schedule. Yeah, the fall. I'm, well, I don't work in the summer. That's right. Summer, I got the kids. They're out of school. I got you know clubs where people don't show up because they'd rather be at the fucking beach. And you walk in there, and the room's three quarter full, and the owner looks at you like we you can't draw. We were last week. Yeah, right. But it's rodeo week this right, week. Right, right, right. No, it's I don't do the song. Uriah Heap is playing at the yeah. State Fair. Who yeah. gives a no. fuck? No, I'm at movie night with my kids. We're yeah. going to the beach, taking little weekend trips. That's yeah, the I'm, summer. I'm, I'm upset that I got to leave this weekend, but not really. I'm going to Kansas City on Friday to the Uptown Theater, and Saturday night I will be at the Paramount Theater in Denver. We added a second show, nice. nine thirty. Uh, we got a few tickets left there, a few tickets left in Kansas City. I'm excited. I'm going to eat some green chili on Saturday. Oh, yeah? That's what I go to Colorado for, oh, my no green shit. motherfucking chili. Where do I get it? Uh, Sam's number four. What's, what's it's name? number? It's right next to the club. Sam's number three? Or? Sam's number three. Next to the Denver Comedy Works? Yeah. No nice, shit. Nice bowl of green it's really chili good. Oh. with two tortillas. Stop All right. it. Stop And they're open for breakfast, too. And they're open for breakfast. You get a little... Two eggs, bacon with potatoes, with toast. You fucking say, I don't want toast. Give me a bowl of green chili, too. And you have that little green chili for breakfast. Your dick is nice and hard. It's spicy. It's good. Ooh. Keep the bowels moving with that. Oh, huh? you take a shit. Smoke comes out of it. You know what I'm saying? There's a little smoke. <laughs> Looks like grandpa's basement. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> don't forget, the church is brought to you by my bookie. Listen, football season is upon us. You like winning money? You like betting sports? I'll tell you where I put my money down. MyBookie.ag. If you're trying to bet the NFL, baseball, UFC, MMA, street hockey, whatever the fuck, they got better incentives and more lines than any other sports book, period. This year they're running a super contest. $100 to enter. You pick five teams against the spread. You rack up the points. First place is guaranteed $100,000. No. Where are you going to get that from? Fuck Damn. Yeah. And it's $100 to enter. They just revamped their site, and it's looking tremendous. So go take a look if you haven't. I know there's Major League action tonight. I know there's fucking football this tomorrow. I know there's football on Saturday. Let's do this shit. Double your first deposit now. Use promo code CHURCH to get a 100% bonus on your initial deposit of up to a thousand dollars. Nobody takes care of you like your Uncle Joey. Visit mybookie.ag today, right now. That's mybookie.ag. And don't forget to use the promo code CHURCH when creating your account to claim your bonus. And don't forget, Thursday morning, check my Instagram account, Matt Flavors World. I'm going to be dropping a video for you motherfuckers. I don't have pics this week. What I have is advice on how to make Gita's. And use my bookie to make fucking Gitas. The church is also brought to you by 4 Listen, with age comes wisdom, but getting older can also be a downer in that one specific area. 40% of men by the age of 40 struggle from not being able and to maintain an erection. Why do guys turn to weird solutions? Or they don't do nothing at all when they can turn to medicine and science? Expensive pills, injections... When no man wants him, no, 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 no. Listen, be wise. Check out hymns. That's forhims.com, a one stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Well known generic equivalents 
to name brand prescriptions to help you combat erectile dysfunction. Prescription solutions backed by science and made more affordable by 4 See results where other treatments fall short. And it's easy. You answer some questions about your medical history. You chat with a doctor. It's a confidential review. And if you're approved, products are shipped directly to your door. Being, being your best means performing at your best. Listen, it's love season. Nobody wants to show up with a gun with no bullets. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Go to 4 Try it right now today and start off with a free online visit. Go to 4 slash church. That's 4 slash church. Prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require an online consultation with a physician who will determine if the prescription is appropriate or not. See website for full details and safety information. Let me tell you something. This could cost you $100 if you went to a doctor. But I'm going to save you money. Remember that. It's 4 slash church. The church is also brought to you one of my personal favorites. These guys are doing an amazing job. Kettlebell Kitchen. All right? They're started by two Army vets who are also brothers. Their mission was to change people's lives through making healthy food more accessible. Eating healthy today, it's on everybody's mind. What, when, and where, how much to eat, we're confused. Meal planning and prep time. You listen, you don't want to spend your entire Sunday chopping carrots and roasting chicken breast, do you? That's where Kettlebell Kitchen comes in. They help you stay on your diet by taking out the hassle of shopping and cooking. These meals come right to you twice per week for optimal freshness. Plus, you'll never get bored because they offer a personalized menu. Whatever works for you. Vegetarian, keto, Whole30, Paleo, they got it. You can even filter by your calorie, protein, fat, carb limits so you get exactly the right foods for your unique needs. And all their meals are free of dairy, soy, artificial sweeteners, and are made from ingredients that are usually naturally gluten-free. Unlike any other meal boxes, you can order one meal at a time. That's what I like. Or sign up for the plan, and you can change it up any time. No long-term contracts. They sent me a sample of some Cuban pork roast. Listen, I'm fucking Cuban, and it was delicious. So what the hell are you waiting for? Feed the champion inside of you with Kettlebell Kitchen. Do me a favor. Grab a pen. Go to kettlebellkitchen.com right now. Kettlebell, K-E-T-T-L-E, Bell, B-E-L-L, Kitchen. Put it together, put a dot com, and there you go. Enter code CHURCH, and I'm going to give you $25 off each of your first two orders to new customers, okay? Uncle Joey's always showing up like the three wise men. I'm showing up with an envelope. That's $25 off your first two orders at kettlebellkitchen.com. Pressing code CHURCH. I want to thank Kettlebell Kitchen. I want to thank him, 4 hymns.com, and I want to thank my bookie. Don't forget, Instagram tomorrow, My Flavors World. I'm dropping a fucking video for you. I want to thank the original Irishman, fuck the movie, my brother, Mr. Greg Fitzsimmons, the real Irishman. This motherfucker paints houses. I want to thank the Christ <laughs> Killer, uh, happy whatever it is. I know tomorrow's another holiday. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Happy New Year to you and your family. Thank you. I hope you find the bag of pennies and fucking. Me too. Most importantly, I want to thank you guys for listening, for supporting the podcast. You know I love you to all my heart. Don't forget, Uptown Motherfucking Theater, Friday night, 8 o'clock. The Paramount Theater, 7 o'clock is sold out. 9.30 tickets are available, all right? See you Tuesday morning. I love you. Stay black. Have a great weekend. Lee, kick this motherfucking mule. <laughs>